Podcast, sponsored by The Big 98, Nashville's number one for new country and the home of The Bobby Bones Show. We're honored to have on the show an incredible comedian, singer, songwriter. He's done it all, and he's a Grand Ole Opry member, Gary Mule Deer. Thank you. Gary, I'll tell you what, you know, we were talking before we came in the studio. Yeah. I feel like, not that I've really grown up, but if I had grown up and become adulty, that I've grown up with you. Yeah. Because you've been on TV doing incredible comedy shows for all my life, and, and with this great new documentary, yeah. you know, show business is my life, but I can't prove it. Yeah. It's like it's reignited your career again. It really has. It's amazing. You know, I just, I never thought I would do something. The reason I'm still around, I always made sure I didn't have anything to fall back on. <laughs> that's why I'm still here. But yeah, it's, it's, you know, people used to say to me, I'd run up to them, they'd say, or now they're saying, Gary Muldeer, you were always my favorite comedian. I forgot all about you. And then they see me now. It's like, oh yeah, I remember all that stuff. You were judging the gong show. You did, right. did that. Which, by the way, was one of my most favorite things to do. Chuck Barris was incredible to work with. That had to be a blast. Well, also, oh. uh, Don Kirshner's rock concert. That was a good one. That, I will never forget you from that. You know, I did a one, TV, one Tonight Show with David Brenner. Mm -hmm. And out of that, the next day, I get a call to go meet Woody Allen. I walk into a giant cavernous studio, and down at the end, he's sitting on a couch with his assistant. I walk all the way down. He stands up and introduces me to his assistant shakes my hand and said, are you busy Monday? <laughs> I said, no. He said, you'll be hearing from me. And I, sure enough, within a few days, I was at the Source restaurant doing, doing that, sh that movie. And the reason I got cut out of the movie, I found out, is because they didn't find this out till a few years ago. If you have a line funnier than Woody's before his next line, it gets cut out. I didn't know that. So I'm sitting with a girl in a booth, and, and it's a health food restaurant, and I say, the concert was incredible. He blew up a grand piano and electrocuted a dog. Are you going to finish those sprouts? <laughs> so they cut that out completely. The next thing, the waitress comes up to Woody and says, Can I? he just says, I'll have the sprouts. And he hands her the, the menu. That's what actually happened. I'm in the movie. I'm 74th in the credits as Man in Health Food Restaurant <laughs> to call my friends to see the movie. And I didn't get any notes. I'm on the floor. I'm on the cutting room floor. But how your career and life have been, because you have been mentioned and been on all of these TV shows, yeah. and even in the Gilmore Girls, they mention you. I know. Somebody told me that the other day. They saw it the other night, saw a rerun. <laughs> you know, the Smothers Brothers, actually, in 1963, in Spearfish, South Dakota, Black Hills State Teachers College, I had a partner. We were called the Black Hills, too. We won the talent contest. The way we won it, we did a Kingston Trio song and a Smothers Brothers routine. We did the John Henry routine, and we got first place. Wow. First place, you got to drive yourself to Denver and appear at the officers' club at the airbase for free, and get one meal and get to stay overnight. That was first place. <laughs> that was our first prize. <laughs> and I stayed. That, but that's how got, they got me out of South Dakota. Right. The Smothers Brothers did. So I stayed in Denver for a year, and then I lied to the guy, which you saw in the thing that I could play bass. Right. And went out to California, and they put a bass in my hand, and I can't play bass, and. <laughs> Van Dyke Parks walks up to me, the head of the group at the time, and says, Gary, what's wrong? And I said, oh, I can't really play bass, but I'm funny. He said, we're not looking for funny, Gary. <laughs> and they put me out on the street for four hours while they rehearsed. Mm -hmm. The guy that brought me out came in and said, I'm going to let you take you up to a club because uh, I know the cook up there at a club called Leadbetters, Randy Sparks Club. And he said, you can stay at his couch for a couple of days, and that's it. And then I walk in, and here I see John Deutschendorf, who wasn't John Denver yet. I see Steve Martin, who's a magician. I see the Carpenters, who are 12 and 13. I see Mike Settle in the first edition. John, uh, yeah, Kenny Rogers is just the bass player in the group. I mean, Mike Settle had, Mike Settle was, he decided he wanted to travel, so he left, and Kenny took over the group. But here I am in the middle of all this stuff, and I've only been in LA two days. Oh my gosh. And the next night I come in, and I didn't know what I'm gonna do, but the, came in with the cook, and. The guy that runs the place said, can you check IDs? I said, yeah. He said, well, uh, Mike, Michael Martin Murphy is leaving the new society. We're doing auditions. So sign people up. <laughs> so I signed them up. You know, I signed everybody up. And I ended up winning the audition, which you saw in the, in the uh, documentary. documentary, which was just crazy. I mean, I didn't know what I was going to do. Yeah. And so I just told that story. Should I tell that story? Or do I need to tell it? No, please. I mean, so I'm back. I'm, I'm, it's my time to go on stage. So I just went up and I said, 
I'm only I'm from South Dakota. I've only been in LA for a couple of days. I saw a guy and a girl fighting out in the alley. She stabbed him in the hand with a fingernail file, and then I walk in and so I take out my hand. And I've got it wrapped <laughs> with some lipstick on it. <laughs> it looks like blood. And for some reason, Randy Sparks in the back said, "You're in. <laughs> That's it. You don't even have to play or sing. Thank God, because I couldn't play or sing very well." But it's just amazing. I mean, what a storied life. And I mean, yeah. everything that you've accomplished before this. Yeah. But also, we have to talk about it, Gary. This has been the year of the mule deer. This is I year. mean, because yeah. uh, South Dakota Hall of Fame yeah. being inducted into the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah. That's I mean, right. it says so on your guitar picks. It, it's right. It can't be false. No, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> I've been waiting to take those out for about <laughs> 11 years. <laughs> I don't know how many times I saw you on the Opry. And you wow. know, and once again, as you and I were talking, Gary, yeah. it's not an easy deal to where, you know, when, when you're in between, sandwiched in between, you know, Lady A yeah. and Jamie Johnson and all That's these right. great artists, and yeah. then you get up and do your comedy. Yeah. I not think, an easy thing to do. No, they just accept me out there, and it's real comfortable. A lot of it families, which I'm very comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. I've had, always had a thing, I always said, I never thought adult humor was very grown up. That's what I've always, I've always worked that way. And I just, for some reason, I bridge the gap. Right. The mom will say, I've never seen the kids laugh like that. And the kids will say, we've never seen dad laugh like that. Right. But I mean, it's like, it's some, for some reason, I, it works for me. Well, and I think the incredible testament in this documentary, and, and it's so powerful, it's like, it's one of those documentaries like we were talking to where you don't want to watch it just one time, you want no. to watch it multiple times, but, but people yeah. like Conan O'Brien, yeah. Jay Leno, Clint Eastwood, Steve Martin, the list goes on and on. You've got Carrot Top yeah. saying these amazing things about you, but yeah. you, were, you forged the original ground with doing some of this prop, prop comedy like The Rubber Chicken. I had, to, yeah, the rubber chicken, which is something that I just, one night, I'd been up for three days. I was in Reno, and I thought, I always used to take, here's a scene from the American Sportsman. I'd take three rubber chickens, put a rubber-tipped arrow on my guitar, throw them up, and shoot my guitar off. So then I got to thinking one night, let's tape a rubber chicken to the microphone. Let's put a blindfold on him. Let's put a cigarette in his mouth. So let's put a cigarette in my mouth. I'll light it and I'll have flash paper in my hand. It'll look like the chicken passed gas. That explodes in my face. People go nuts over that. I walk off about 20 feet and brace myself. And, and if I miss, I tell a joke. I shoot until I get it. Right. I take five arrows. And the record is David Letterman show 32 feet just before a commercial. I just shot it out of, held it up about this high and flipped the cigarette right out of the chicken's mouth. And, Normally, you know, the place went crazy. Mm -hmm. Now I have to do it all the time. You know? Right. But, but that's just one thing that I've always done. But does it seem kind of surreal to you at this point in your life, Gary, yeah. to where you have, you know, peers like David Letterman yeah. and, and all these other great comedians, yeah. you know, J.J. Walker, you yeah. know, Jimmy Walker, you know, all of these comedians saying how much they love you and your comedy yeah. and how much it meant to have you out on the scene. Yeah. You know, we were talking about, you know, the comedy houses like, you know, oh, back yeah. when, you know, you and Moondog were doing stuff to where it's like, yeah. you know, you had already been on the road doing comedy for years. I've been for years doing, doing bars and Gilda's bars like in Wyoming where they have the chicken wire up. They don't like the song. They toss their real It's like the bottles. Blues Brothers. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's the kind of place. But Moondog and I, this was great. We started opening for rock and roll acts. And that's what was pretty amazing. We started, we were on the first Doobie Brothers tour. We started out with the Doobie Brothers when there were 2,000 people. Then it became 5,000, then it became 10. And the way that it ended, we were at the Ohio State University. There's like 40,000 out there. We were, they were not on the bill. Mm -hmm. They yelled, tonight, uh, tonight it's gonna be the Doobie Brothers. Yeah, and then and you hear, and Moondog and Mule there, which you can barely hear. We walk out. I walk up to the microphone, Dennis goes to the piano, a, beer, a wine bottle bounces off the piano, and a, a beer can goes flying by my head, and Dennis just walked over to my mic and said, we're the Mule Deer Moon Dog Medicine Show, good night. <laughs> and we walked off, and the producer said, good move, don't worry about it. And after that, they put the Beach Boys on and took us off. But, I mean, we went through that whole thing with the Doobie Brothers, it was just bigger and bigger audiences, right. with no billing. But you know, but it's it to me. You know, I love comedy, and certainly yeah. I love your comedy. Yeah. To where you know it, it it takes you away. Yeah. You know, you're able to relax and laugh and enjoy it. And so now 
you know, I know, you know, being out on tour for 29 years as Johnny Mathis opening for you. Yeah, and closing. Yeah. Right, that's oh, not a bad gig. That's a great gig. <laughs> that's, that's as good as it gets. <laughs> No, to have somebody like that, it's, it, I have these wonderful jobs. I really do. But how did you get this gig? It's, I was doing a golf Johnny tournament. Mathis. Golf tournament. Golf changed my life. When I came out of rehab, I needed a new addiction. And I, cha I exchanged two four-letter words. I exchanged Coke for golf. Mm -hmm. And I started playing golf after I came out of rehab because I just wanted to do, take off the weight I'd put on in rehab and all this stuff. I would do, walk 18 holes in the morning, no lessons, just watch other guys, pick up my ball if I was holding people up. I'd stop, have lunch, walk another 18, then work the comedy store at night. And one day, one day, Smokey Robinson was out there and he came across the fairway from the other, other side and said, Gary Mueller, do you ever do celebrity golf tournaments? I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, no. He said, I'm taking you to one. And in two weeks, we went to, to uh, Roy Clark's golf tournament in Burbank. And what happens the night of the banquet before the tournament, everybody gets up and does 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. There'll be Glenn Campbell, there'll be Ben Skill, there'll be Johnny Mathis, there'll be me, there'll be somebody like that, you know, Smokey Robinson. Then the next day we, pl we play golf. And so I did that, and that's how I got to start playing golf. And then I went to the Crosby tournament one night, and we we're opening we're with them with Glenn Campbell. I went Gerald Ford on stage, it's Vince Gill, it's uh, Johnny Mathis, all these people. And then the next day, we're on the driving range, and Johnny Mathis turns to me and says, the lady's been with me for 21 years, Jeanine Bernier is retiring, would you like the job? I said, sure. He said, you'll go on in the middle. And he turned back to hit balls again to find out that what happens is he goes out for about 35 minutes, brings me out, he goes back and puts out a different outfit, rests his voice, I do 25, there's an intermission, he comes back out and does an hour 15. So really, Johnny Mathis opens and closes the show for me, which <laughs> is as good as it gets. I mean, this is amazing. And it's, you know, I get to play for audiences that know, still know how to be an audience. Right. I get that with him, I get that with, uh, with the Opry. Definitely. That's why I can't wait to get out there with I don't know, the kids and whoever. And it's just fun to watch them change. Randy's sitting at the piano all the time. Randy Hart, yeah. my best friend. Exactly. Since 77 when he was Roger Miller's conductor. Mm -hmm. uh, Ra Randy watches out there and he sees people that at first are just looking like this. And then they're looking, then they're looking, they're wise. should I laugh? And then pretty soon by the time it's over, we've got them. <laughs> but Randy can always tell and he uh -huh. says, they always, it, I always get them no matter what, even if it's the last joke. Well, you know, yeah. and that's what is, is not lost on me, too. Yeah. You know, you and Randy Hart have been, oh. you know, and he's, you know, music director yeah. on the opera now, yeah. but it's like friends for so many years, yeah. and now you're sharing the stage together yeah. through this experience. And one of the reasons I've never hung, I, I'm surprised the guys all came that were comedians to be on night because I never hung out a lot with comedians. I hung out with funny musicians. Right. The funniest person I ever knew in my life was Roger Miller. There was nobody funnier than Roger Miller. Wow. And here's Randy Hart being his musical director. I remember Roger one time, the VIPs were waiting after the show to, to you know, you get so many VIPs mm -hmm. in the green room, and Roger was late. Roger comes in, I'm standing there, and he opens a can of Coke, and he puts it on his forehead, and it all dribbles down his face, down the front, and down to the floor. He looks at the can of Coke and says, geez, I thought I was taller than that. <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of stuff Roger. Ray Stevens said he ran into Roger at the airport once and said, Roger, where have you been? He said, played in Kansas City last night, beat him six to four. I mean, he just never stopped with stuff. Wow. He but just, that's like you. That's what everybody yeah, says about you to yeah. where, you know, even backstage, I mean, in the documentary, yeah. they're talking, yeah. you know, and I love the reenactments and everything. Oh, yeah. They can't be better than you. Yeah. But it's like, it's everybody's talking about that all the other comedians are surrounding you, that people want to be backstage with you yeah, watching, as much yeah. as front of house when you're yeah. performing. Yeah. What a huge compliment. And it's so funny because they would stand back and watch me. Then after the, after the night was over, they would all gather somewhere to talk over their shows. They'd go to delis, whatever. Mulder would head off down Sunset Strip and meet people like Robbie Krieger and, the, and, and some of the birds. And right. people, that's where I wanted to go. Yeah. That's where I, I would go that way to go find Johnny Rivers or find oh, different gosh. people down on the Strip. Yeah. And I hung out with funny musicians. That's why the Smothers Brothers were so big for me. Mm -hmm. That's why Vince Gill to me is one of the funniest people I've oh, ever yeah. hung out with. And, but it's always, and my favorite, my comedic influence was a musician. He didn't play much, but he was a musician. And I'll tell you who this was. I'm playing a Playboy Club one night with Moondog 
at Lake Geneva, and a guy comes up and says, somebody back in, at the back wants to, wants to meet you. I walked around, and there's Jack Benny, who shakes my hand and said, young man, you have the potential of my timing. And I said, you can't imagine. I grew up with radio. Didn't have any TV until I was in senior high school. Right. He was the guy. He was the guy. And he said, you know, with the violin, the whole thing. But always been plenty of musicians. To me, that's the guys I hung out with all the time. And I saw, and there's all the musicians are really funny. Musicians will sit around and just crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. Comedians sit around, and after a while, one's trying to top the other. Ah. And with with the with the with the music guys, they kind of just add to the mix. Right. And I had some of the. I mean, nobody that Opry band. Nobody's serious out there. No, but also they're is. having the time of their lives. They're having the time of their lives. It's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a few comedians I've hung out with, yes, but for the most part, funny musicians has been for well, me. Well, you know, and the thing is, too, with your career, Gary, you've always intertwined the music. I mean, yeah. obviously with your Gibson guitars, yeah. you know, your J200 over the years, yeah. now that's all, has all these great signatures. You can't take it on the road. No, I so can't. So now you've got your Gibson Hummingbird. Yeah. But you've been a Gibson guy through and through. I'll tell you uh, and, and what happened with what, the first night I dropped my pick in my guitar. I was actually playing, and I just shook it out, and it worked so well, I've, now I've got it in the act. <laughs> I do Ring of Fire when I sing, I fell in, boom, it goes in, and I have to shake it out. That's when I have to go down on the floor, and that's why I do my first bit in the guitar mic down here. Right. And which I've always been able to do. But with Gibson, yeah, I've been the guy that's always shot arrows off of it. Right. You know? I shot arrows off that, that 77 Gibson for, since 77, we still haven't had the neck fit. I had, the neck is still perfect on that guitar. Wow. That's how great those guitars are. And my, yeah, it happened, I was doing the Letterman show and Cheryl Crow was in the little dressing room next to only two little dressing rooms for Letterman. Mm -hmm. And I said, would you sign my guitar? She said, sure. So she signed Cheryl Crow up here. The next week I went to play the AT&T at Pebble Beach. I did a Johnny Cash song. When I came off, Glenn Fry and Huey Lewis came up to me and said, that was one of the best renditions of a Johnny Cash song we've ever heard. I said, great, will you sign my guitar? <laughs> so I got Glenn Fry and Huey right away, so it's down to three. Then I go do Alice Cooper the next week. I get Alice to sign, and from there it's just exploded. And there's Alice is Rich on the documentary also. Yes, there's Richie Sambora, there's Slash, there's, there's everybody you can think of, Tommy Emmanuel, Vince Gill, Steve Warner, Doyle Dykes, I mean, all these incredible guitar mm -hmm. players are all, all the guys from KISS, they're all on the back of this guitar. It's amazing, and I have to, now I'm starting on the top. I had Keith Urban and Kix Brooks sign underneath the, the head, head, and now when I look down, it's just Steve Earle. I got Steve, which is with me when I go out there on stage. Just amazing. I mean, did you ever think, Gary, when you started this journey, yeah. you know, as a comedian, and obviously, you know, working a lot with musicians as you yeah. continue to, did you think you would get to this point to where, like you and I were talking before we came in studio, yeah. your career is having a resurgence it now. It is. But I'm lucky that I got into this business because, honest to God, my motivations, number one, I wanted a job where I could sleep late <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> and the other one, I noticed that, I noticed that the, the uh, guys with guitars and guys throwing around footballs and beating up each other, you got just as many girls just playing the guitar and not getting beat up over it. So that's another reason. That was a lot of our, our motivations. I talked to a lot of guys, and that's what they say. Yeah. Yeah, we did that for the girls, to play for the girls. <laughs> and that's two, two of my motivations. But I'm very lucky that I've been able to do this. I mean, well, I'm not lucky because I, Johnny Mathis and I talked about this about three years ago. We think now we're the best at what we do than we've ever been. I kind of feel that with myself. I'm not, it's not a bragging thing, it's just like I'm more comfortable than I've ever been up there, right. and I think I do what I do now better than I ever have. I just wish I wasn't one year older than Bugs Bunny and four years younger than Porky Pig, <laughs> because that would really be nice if I'd be, I'm supposed to look in that camera yeah, once in a while, well, like this, all right, good. You did that, got <laughs> yeah, that out of the way? Totally, but Perfect. I gotta bring this up too to where, right. you know, yeah. the documentary has been so popular, oh, yeah. and, uh, and it released, you know, at the Nashville Film Festival. Yeah. And so now it's going to come out on DVD. It is, but it's also streaming now on, on, uh, on Paramount. It's streaming on uh, Amazon yeah. and Hulu, YouTube, all those. It's been streaming now since August 1st on there. So but now you're going to have an exclusive DVD I out have a DVD. at the Opry. Yes, at the Opry. They're going to get the exclusive rights to do it in the Opry gift shop. And I'm hoping, if nothing else, maybe they'll give me, I get a good discount in there. Maybe I'll get a free T-shirt. <laughs> 
How many years have you been playing the opera now? Uh, let's see. You know, I'd start when I was on Hee Haw, the last years of Hee Haw. Right. Well, that had been 94, 95. Well, I know that you right? were on Hee Haw. Well, I was on the Where's last it? year yeah. without, without Buck, of course. Mm -hmm. Buck was gone just with. But Roy Eikhoff saw me and brought me over, and I did, I did, a, I did a show. Right. And then after that, I didn't do one for years and years. But I've been really doing it a lot the last 10, I guess you'd mm -hmm. say. But a lot to get. You know, Jim Ed Brown had a lot to do with me coming on. The, he was after them all the time to what put a, me on. What a great artist. Jim, yeah, Jim Ed was good. And the, the people that run the Opry, it couldn't be any better. I mean, this they is... They love you. Well, this is... You know, this, it, what amazes me, and once again, I've seen you uh, perform on the yeah. Opry multiple times. Yeah. But you get as much applause and accolades as the biggest music artist on the yeah. stage. Yeah, You know, and I mean, that's a sold-out audience every yeah. time you're playing the yeah. Opry. Yeah. And you know something else, one other thing I have to mention. I get all the credit for this and I get all the accolades, whatever, but in 1980, I was at probably one of the, I was getting close to the height of my, my, my Peruvian marching powder days. And I was hired to go back to Spearfish, South Dakota and work for a festival for a lady. And I went, did my show, went over to get my check and the lady's husband's standing there. And I look over and there's this beautiful woman standing there and I said, who are you? And he pulls the check back and says, that's my daughter. And <laughs> I've been with her ever since. Nita, it's in 1980. We've been together ever since. She was, was a model in New York who was coming, just visiting her, her. She was a model and a spokesperson in New York and Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, coming back visiting her parents. And I just happened to come out to do this. And uh, later on, she ended up co-managing me. But to tell you the truth, man, she does so much. I've got a manager, Ryan. I've got a... I've got a, 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 a Chris, I've got an agent down here, but Nita still keeps it all together. Wow. And what I've, she went through with me, mm -hmm. oh my God, you know, it's just, and she stuck with me all this time. She's really a big part of Gary Mule there. That's incredible, yeah, she's though. Really a big To have that kind of team behind oh, you. Oh, she's amazing. Yeah, she's like. And, yeah. and so she's going to be heading up doing the book then. She, yeah, she would be, <laughs> yeah. And then also securing the Gibson endorsement. Yeah. Because there needs to be a Gary Mule Deer signature model. That would be great. That I'd doesn't that. have your foot through it. No, with the chicken on the pit guard. Yes. Yes. It's obviously. Pit guard. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm We've so, got to talk to some people about that, Gary. Yeah, okay. Maybe Gibson? Yeah, maybe Gibson. I know a guy. <laughs> yeah. Or a gal. Oh, man. I just, you know, there's so many things that we couldn't get into with the, to the documentary mm -hmm. because there's just so many things that have happened over the, over the years. And my folk music era was incredible. My rock and roll era was amazing. Right. Working with all these different groups until I finally went out on my own. After Mule Deer and Moondog broke up, that's the first time I had been on stage by myself. I always was either in a group or, you know, so I put the two mics up there and did the two parts <laughs> for about three months until I got used to not having him up there right. and I could take down one mic. And, uh, but for a while I did, I would do the, because we, we had great bits. Yeah. I would just be two different people, put a hat on here, take it off, do this, come oh back. Oh my gosh, Gary. And one of the silliest things ever that people still remember is some of my impressions, which are so silly. Uh, my biggest one was Alice doesn't live here anymore. People still remember that still more request than it. anything else. They re request that. Is, that. is that solid? Well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's monitors. Quick impression of the great movie, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Did she move? That's <laughs> all it is. <laughs> all it is. But More people remember that than anything. <laughs> they always say, you still need the door thing? <laughs> But also, the name of the documentary came from a line in your comedy I because was, it's in there. I was doing the, the uh, I was doing Hollywood Squares, and I was the only person he didn't call on in one of the shows. And Peter Marshall, who now is a good friend of mine, he's 97 now, by the way. Oh my goodness! Peter looked at me and said, "Gary, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We do five shows a day. They'll tell me we'll pick on you next time." I said, that's okay. I said, show business is my life, but I can't prove it. And Jimmy Walker was sitting there. He said, that's a great line. Don't ever forget that. <laughs> and so that's why it finally came to this. Mm -hmm. I used to say that. And I used to say, it's great to be in a business where if you come back for a little less money every year, you can work for the rest of your life. <laughs> and I saw that, but now that's changed. That's changed completely. But yeah, that's, why, that's where that came from. 
It's just incredible. I mean, what a great documentary. And like I said, too, I'm so glad it's coming out on DVD, but obviously yeah. it's available on all the streaming sources. Yeah. And you're still touring with Johnny Mathis. Still out. And, and still playing the opera. Yes, and there'll be other jobs are getting offers for other things. I, I do corporate things once mm -hmm. in a while, but it's going to be a whole different thing now. I got a full time manager, I mean, a full time road manager. I've been with me a long I've always had road managers, and they were always musicians. Every road manager I had from 1970 on has been a, a musician. He was a mu musician too. Yeah. And, and having my, this Mike Grimm with me all the time, I have gone in with, the, with all the Opry band at different times, which is anybody from, uh, besides Danny Parks, and besides Eddie Bears, and besides Larry, and besides uh, Randy Hart, and Steve Warner, all these people have come in and they've done tracks of all my favorite songs. Wow. So I have, they're called my duck and cover band. <laughs> so when I, w I have in in instruments on stage mm -hmm. empty, so when I do my show and Danny Parks takes a solo, I've got the guitar over here LED'd and my guy up there is, is, is doing it, you know, oh in time gosh. with it, where I got a bass solo from Willie Weeks over here. Yeah. I got that, that's covered and we do that with that. Or if there's a mandolin sitting there and Dan Kaminsky is actually playing on oh, it. Dan, so and good. so I say, here's Dan Kaminsky from Alex and Cross. Take it, Dan. So I've got these incredible musicians. You just don't see them. Right. So I have to talk about, you're gonna hear great people tonight. Yeah. You're gonna hear great And they're musicians. all your friends. They're all my friends. Yes, they are, which is just amazing to me. You're yeah. in a good place in life. This has been a yeah, good I year. I, I know it is. I just hope I got enough to get back to you the gotta car. top it next year ah i don't know if i can do that i think so well i think know, it's possible gary i have faith maybe if you just have me on twice <laughs> <laughs> well you know obviously there's going to be you know a book there's going to be you know a, a big tour with yeah, you yeah you know besides johnny mathis other artists are going to want to open for yeah, you yeah yeah they, well maybe not open for me but, <laughs> but you know I, I wrote down my wife and i wrote down how many acts i've worked with over a hundred icons, country western and rock icons. Amazing. And there's everybody on there. And I'm the only guy to ever work with Frank Sinatra and Willie Nelson in the same night. That's ridiculous. Steve Wynn called me at three in the morning one time on 1980. Of course, he knew I'd be up. He knew I used to play <laughs> Keno at his place and never go to bed. Right. And he said, I'm opening the Crystal Ballroom. Frank Sinatra and the orchestra are going to do 45 minutes. We're going to close the curtain. You're going to go out in front. We're going to strike the orchestra, set up Willie's band. Willie's going to play for two hours. Do you want the job? I said, sure. So for, for the three days, until Frank didn't want to do it anymore, for three days, Frank would come out, and then, he, then they'd close the curtain. I would talk as long as they needed to put up the Willie's band. Take a, and the first night, Frank stayed over. He did his show, and he watched my act. Mm -hmm. And he only stayed for two of Willie's songs he left. But he watched my act, and his guy, Jilly, came over to me and said, the man wants to see you. So I walk over, to, and it's Frank Sinatra. And he looks at me, puts his arm, his hand on my shoulder, and says, you're a very unusual young man. <laughs> and that's the only thing Frank Sinatra ever said to me. <laughs> and Jilly, Jilly's over there going, okay, kid, that's it. <laughs> that was it. But that was like all the introductions. Yeah. I mean, everybody that introduced you, even watching like when Dick Clark introduced you on American Bandstand, yeah. and they're not sure how to do it, Gary. Well, I know. They're not sure how to say, well, you know, he's a comedian. It's like, you know, they're just like going, you need to hang on because who knows what's going to happen. I had a lot of props in it, and I was wearing a red, white, and blue tuxedo in those days with a big half row. Somebody told me because of that that there was only two comics on American Bandstand, me and George Carlin, if that's possible. Wow. I heard that. I'm not sure if it's true. But that's I and, and you were on the first H HBO special. Yes, with Freddie Prinze and Friends, with mm, Jay Leno. What a great yes, show! And Tim Thomerson and Elaine Boozler. It was incredible. It's an incredible show. Yeah, the first HBO comedy special. And you're carrying on this legacy now. Yeah, still going Bigger on. Bigger and better. Still doing it. Yeah. Well, I want to make sure for our viewers to be able to, you know, when the DVD comes out, you know, yeah. obviously it's going to be at the Opry yeah. with your shows, with everything you've yeah. got going on. Website-wise, social media, where should they go for everything Gary Miller? Uh, you go to Facebook. I have a Facebook page that I send stuff to my manager and he puts up because tech-wise, I still miss dial phones, okay? One thing I loved about the 70s, I never lost a phone. People, <laughs> people say to me, do you, have a, do you have a cell phone? I said, yeah. They said, do you have a landline? I said, yeah. They said, why do you have a landline if you have a cell phone? I said, I need it to call my, I need a landline to call my cell phone when I can't find it. <laughs> Honest to God, that's why I have a landline. Uh, but yeah, info at GaryMuelder.com 
is my, I guess GaryMuelder.com is where you get uh, what's going on with me right. with, with all this stuff. But there, I guess it's on Facebook. You, you see it on Facebook, just Gary Mueller. That's all and I know. And also one of the most popular comedians on Sirius XM's comedy you channel. You know, I hear that the clean comedy channel, I guess I'm, I'm played a lot. A lot. Yeah, and that's good because I don't listen to it as I'm really tired of this material. I think this <laughs> career could work out for you. I think it's going to be okay. It's starting to get good. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, you know. You know Grand Ole Opry, South yeah. Dakota Hall of Fame, yeah. documentary. Getting close to trading cars. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you haven't seen it yet, please, please watch it. I know you're going to want to buy your own copy at the Opry also when it comes out on DVD. Oh, but show business is my life, but I can't prove it. The incredible, the mythical Gary Mule Deer. Gary, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, and one more thing, into that main camera. Some guy once said it's lonely on the road. Nobody heard him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. That was great. <laughs>Sponsored by The Big 98, Nashville's number one for new country and the home of the Bobby Bones Show. 